don't need a high-end designer or a lot of money to get a luxe look. Be your own interior designer. This is Affordable Interior Design, the podcast. Here's your host, Betsy Hellman. Hi, everyone. I hope you're doing well. Hope you're getting ready for Halloween. You're in the pumpkin spirit. You've got gourds, you've got garlands. Good for you. I myself am still mourning the end of summer, still coming to terms with the fact that I will not have another beach day, but I'm so excited to be here with you guys and to be in Connecticut. There's no better place to be in the fall. So if I have to be anywhere when the leaves are changing, I might as well be right here with festivals and all sorts of fun things to do every single weekend. Well, guys, you have been sending in your wonderful questions and my favorite thing to do is answer them. So without further ado, I'll head into this mailbag, but you're wondering to yourself, Betsy, how can I send you a question? I have so, so many design dilemmas. Well, you'll go to affordableinteriordesign.com slash podcast. Once again, that's affordableinteriordesign.com slash podcast. There you'll see a little form. You just click, you fill it out, you attach some pictures if you like, and I will get to your question very, very soon. All right, without further ado, let me get to the questions I've already got right here. The first one comes from Mayan, and Mayan's writing from Houston, Texas. She says, Hi, Betsy. I'm currently decorating my home with a shabby chic feel. My home is a small, open concept space with a big wall full of windows that face the yard. Some are seated windows, and others are thin and tall. We currently have blinds, but I do not like the look. I want curtains, but I don't want to overwhelm the space. How can I decorate these windows? Please help. Well, first of all, Mayan, I do not blame you for being anxious and having questions. Dressing windows is very complicated. It's not always straightforward, and each window has its own challenges. And when we're trying to design a space that has many, many windows, how do we make this space feel cohesive while treating the windows differently because they are different? Now, in your case, I'm scrolling through these pictures, and yes, you have one very long wall that has, you know, in this picture, five windows on it, but one of the windows is more inset. It has a deeper ledge. Now, I would not call it like a seated window by any chance, and or by any means, I mean, and I don't know what you meant by seated window. I was thinking window seat. But looking at these pictures, I don't see anything like that here. So I'm just seeing a series of windows, one of which has a deeper ledge. But the other thing that's exciting me is that these windows tend to be at the same height visually. So I actually think we can treat these windows very similarly. I think this is a pretty easy solve. So I'm excited about that. Now, as you know, from listening to this podcast for eons, and if you haven't been listening for eons, well, what are you waiting for? There's nearly 400 episodes for you to sink your teeth into, but this is going to be very straightforward. What I would do is you have, you know, an L shape. Um, As I mentioned, there's that long wall that has four very similar windows Then in the dining room, it has a slightly deeper ledge, but it's the same height and it's three windows kind of right in a row together. And then the wall perpendicular to that, that leads out, well, it looks out, excuse me, onto the patio is one of the same windows that we saw in that line of windows on that big wall. So everything is at relatively the same height, give or take an inch. Everything has been treated with white slatted blinds. And in my opinion, a fully dressed window has both blinds and drapes. Now, the blinds are meant to be manipulated, opened, closed, louvered, depending on what type of light and privacy you want. Whereas the drapes tend to stay at the side, flank the window, add color, pattern, texture, height, but they aren't typically manipulated. You wouldn't typically close them unless you need blackout or unless your windows are quite drafty. And so you're wanting to prevent that air from getting in. Um, Yeah, you would just leave them at the side so that they've kind of framed the window nicely. 
Now, what I like to do when I'm treating windows or when I'm deciding how to treat a window is I go to the most complicated window. So the most complicated window can mean the one closest to the corner. It can mean the one that's kind of the oddest in shape, like the dining room window that has three windows stuck together. It can mean one that sort of sticks out as different. In this case, the one that sticks out as most different is that dining room window that is a little bit inset with the deeper ledge. I would say it has a six inch ledge and the other windows have a three inch ledge. So it's not even all that different, right? But the other difference for this window is that the glass doesn't go all the way to the sides with the window frame. There is a piece of wall that's again about six inches between the side of the window frame and the corner of the window box or where the ledge begins. So I would say that that's a little bit different as well. Keeping those two things in mind, I would do... Okay, let me tell you something else. Did you guys put on your thinking caps today? There's one other thing I feel like I might want to tell you. I'm on the fence here. Now, I'm going to assume that you're never going to draw these drapes. But if I look at the other side of this deep dining room window, I can see that there's only about eight inches from the window box, right, to the corner of the room. And that's troubling me, maybe, maybe not. No, no, I'm not going to let it trouble me because what I would do here in this much wider window is I would use a double wide panel. Typically you want double the width of drapery that you have width of window. And I'm going to guesstimate here that you have mm, like 115 inches of window in terms of the width. That's just a guesstimate between 100 and 115. So that means that each panel needs to be 100 or 115. And we know that um, panels come in between 40 and 50 so inch widths. So we would need two double wide panels. That means that each panel would be 100 inches on either side of this long dining room window. And we would hang the rod up above the window box and hang it so that it brushes the floor. Now, what we wanna do is go with a standard size of drape. You don't wanna to have to get this hemmed. So hopefully you'll find something, I'm eyeballing this and thinking the 96 inch range would work well. Cause if the 96 doesn't work, then you have to go 108. And I think you'd have to get a hemmed at that point. So anyway, I would hang the rod, the bracket on the rod, outside the window box, like four inches, because that will cover that weird space between the window frame and the corner of the window inset box where it meets the ledge. Meaning, I know this is kind of granular guys. I hope you guys had coffee. Meaning that we're not gonna see that weird piece of window meaning that this is going to give it a much more homogenous look with the other windows because the other windows are going to be so much easier to treat. So we went four inches outside and we'll do the same thing on the other side of the window, four inches outside so that it covers that weird little void and it's going to brush the floor. Then with all the other windows, you're going to hang the rod at the same height that you did the dining room window, as well as having them brush the amount outside could vary. Although in this case, I don't think it should. I would do four inches outside, but on these windows, you'll do a single panel, a single panel wide drape because these are much narrower windows. I'm eyeballing it at 36 inches wide. That will be the perfect thing and will make everything really flow. will really break up this long wall of windows and add color, pattern, texture, softness. I think the room desperately needs window treatments. So I'm glad you wrote in. And even though that was a very long-winded explanation, I hope it's applied to a lot of your situations for those of you listening, because window treatments are very tricky. 
And um, once you know some of the rules, you're able to apply them to lots of different scenarios. So I've shared lots of different rules. So hopefully you guys can find a nugget or a bit of information that will work for your situation. My next question is coming from Benjamin, and he is writing from La Mareda, California. Hi, Betsy. I love listening to your show on my way to work. Your voice sounds so calming to me. I love your storytelling and your solutions are always spot on. My wife and I have a dilemma on what color to paint our staircase handrails on the staircase and entrance. Currently, it's a red oak with white spindles and newels. The staircase risers and treads are also red oak, as well as our living room floors and front door, which are also red oak. We want to update the area by getting rid of all the red oak, except for the floor. Our design is traditional transitional with rosewood furnishings. Should we paint the handrails and front door all in white to match the spindles and newels? Or should we paint the handrails a glossy black or dark brown to match the furniture? But then we feel it wouldn't match the staircase steps as we're gonna keep this floors, the red oak. Please help us. Thank you for your time and good luck with your pregnancy. Wishing you a happy, healthy baby. Well, thank you, Benjamin, so much. I really appreciate that. Now, when looking at these pictures, you know, the floors are a pretty big visual element in your space. And typically I keep all the architectural elements. So the handrails, the stairs, the floors, the same in terms of the finishes, right? And then the furniture does not have to match. Guys, your architecture in terms of um, the wood floor stain does not have to match your furniture. In fact, sometimes that can feel too matchy matchy. So I am totally fine with the furniture not matching these elements. The thing that is bothering me is that these pieces of staircase would then not match the flooring, which to me feels quite incongruous. And you mentioned in your note that your style leans more towards, you know, transitional, traditional. And I worry that painting it black in terms of the handrail would just feel very severe. Now, I understand if this color of wood is not your favorite, but what I would be more inclined to do is do a stairway runner, which is like a carpeted stairway going all the way up that will conceal quite a bit of this wood. And then I would leave the post painted white and I definitely think you could paint the front door. So I think the front door being the same tone is not a necessity, but I think it will feel very odd if you're changing the color of the stairs and handrail and don't change the color of the flooring, if you really don't like this color and you're going to be here a long time, it may be worth changing the color of the flooring. Um, but in my opinion, and based on the question you asked, I would go with a path of least resistance, right? And add a stairway runner and paint the front door. Now the front door typically would be painted the same color as the trim, right? Or depending on what the front of the front door is, you could do a fun color or something like that. But I think this is the opportunity to break free. I also think that you could consider adding more rugs, painting this main area a different color, just to draw your eye away from the flooring if re-sanding and restaining the floor just isn't in your budget. It might be a way to help detract because right now this floor is very featured because it's so uncovered because there's so much of it. I would challenge your furniture layout. So the next time you write me, maybe write me with some furniture layout questions because I think a nice big rug under the dining table would be quite impressive. I think a larger rug showcasing the living area would be really nice. And this is a big open concept space for those of you not seeing the pictures on YouTube. When we have big open concept spaces, it can be tempting to carve out tiny corners or tiny vignettes within the space on little rugs. 
But really, we want to make each zone feels as large as it is while still allowing for a three foot walkway between the zones. So I'm not suggesting wall to wall carpeting or having a carpet that just leaves you with a little narrow runway on which you can walk. I do think you do need to separate these with ample space, but you've left too much space, you know, between the edge of the living room rug and the piano, there's at least six feet. And so it's making that living room look so small and dinky. And what's further emphasizing the fact that your living room is kind of small and dinky, even though it could be made larger visually with that rug and it is a good size square foot wise, is that you have these huge vaulted ceilings. I mean, I think these ceilings are hmm, between 15 and 18 feet high. And so, you know, we really want to rise to the occasion, not only by expanding kind of our furniture and making it fit the scale of the space, but also going a little bit higher with our artwork. So you have artwork that's not very tall and it's really dwarfing the walls, dwarfing the space. So I would want you to focus on some more vertical pieces. I would also want you to focus on maybe some, um, out of scale, large scale pieces, the large mirror. I think right now your furniture is playing as if it was in an eight foot high room with small little rooms. And instead you've got this big open concept space and you're really not bringing a big picture or big vision to it. So I know that's a lot more than you asked, Benjamin. And now you're in your car driving to work or whatever. And you're so frustrated. You're like, Betsy, this was much more than I bargained for. And I don't want to make any of those changes, but I think you're focusing on all the wrong things, Benjamin. And I think by refocusing on these problems that I think are much more dire, you're going to get a better effect. Everyone, if you don't want to hear the truth, don't write into me. And if you are ready for the truth, then please send me your questions. Affordableinteriordesign.com slash podcast. Until next time, everybody. A big thank you to Aton and the Embassy who wrote our theme song. A shout out to Catherine Heller who owns the podcast shop and is our editor extraordinaire. We also want to thank Jenny Sunnison and her team at the Savvy Podcast Agency for their help with our social, our YouTube channel, and so much more. We also want to thank Uploft, which is our parent company who supports this podcast. And lastly, we owe a huge debt of gratitude to you. Thank you so much for tuning in and for all your support. <music>